After setting the expressions equal to each other and canceling the minus signs on both sides and the h, y not terms, and after moving like terms to the same side, so I moved all the terms with omega tilde on to this, the right side, and k tilde to the left side, and all the material parameters here to the left side as well. So this is what we end up with if we make those three changes. To simplify this further, it looks like we should take the square root of the entire equation. And then we have 1 over square root of epsilon mu again, which we know from table 7-1 that that's going to be equal to the velocity of our wave, which I'm going to say is equal to c since we have free space. So then what we wind up with is sine omega tilde delta t over 2 is c delta t over delta x times sine k tilde delta x over 2. So here I wrote the right side of the equation first after taking the square root. When we went through this exercise earlier using the analytical solutions, we solved for omega tilde. So that's another reason I'm writing the right side of this equation first, right here. So we're going to solve here for omega tilde. If we do that, we're going to get 2 over delta t and then after taking the arc sine, uh, which I'll just write as sine to the minus 1, c delta t, we get everything on the right, delta x, and sine k tilde delta x over 2. Well, this is the numerical dispersion relation, and it is definitely not the same form of the analytical dispersion relation we obtained earlier. This slide shows both the analytical dispersion relation we obtained earlier and the numerical dispersion relation we just derived now. The numerical dispersion relation does not show a simple linear relationship between the angular frequency and the wave number, as we had for the analytical case. So what is the impact of this numerical dispersion relation not being the same as the analytical one? Well, first, we can see that in the expression for the numerical angular frequency, we could run into trouble if the quantity in the brackets here is bigger than 1 or smaller than minus 1, because the arc sine of that quantity would give us a complex number. So for the moment, if we assume k tilde, we're going to assume that this is real for the moment. That means that this sine term in brackets, is if this is all it's going to be uh, give a value between minus 1, minus 1, and 1. So then if the first term in the bracket, this one right here, c delta t delta x, is less than or equal to 1, so if we want this to be less than or equal to 1, then the full quantity, both of these terms together, will be between minus 1 and 1, which is what we need to get a real number. So because of this, c delta t over delta x is given a special name. It's called the 1D Courant Stability Factor, which we will abbreviate as just capital S. So for example, if we set C delta T over delta x equal to S, and then we make sure S is equal to a number less than or equal to 1, we can solve for dt to determine the maximum time step increment that we can use in a 1D simulation of a wave propagating in free space. So here I'm going to solve for this term. We have delta t is equal to s delta x over c, and we want to make sure s is less than or equal to 1. So question, what if we have some other materi material other than free space? How does this change? Well, electromagnetic waves in materials can propagate more slowly than c meters per second. c is the fastest that the wave can propagate. So as a result, the wave propagating in free space is the worst case scenario. So setting dt equal to s delta x over c with s less than or equal to 1 should always be sufficient to keep the numerical dispersion relation from having a complex number. 
Since you have a working one-dimensional code by now, let's first try a value higher than this current limit and see what happens. Introduce a new variable into your program, this s, and set it equal to 1.01, .01, which is just barely above the current limit. Then set delta t equal to s times delta x over c. What happens in your simulation? 